Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here as always with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Tony, it's time for me to do, well, us, not just me. I'm, I'm going to say us. I'm going to include you here. Oh, thank you. Us to do one of our favorite shows of the year. Uh, one of the shows that has uh, brought us one of our more recent negative reviews that accused us uh, a couple of years ago of being extremely homerish and uh, being completely unfair uh, for viewing Ohio State as having su uh, superior football players to Michigan. Uh, I believe that was the year that Ohio State beat Michigan by 23, but it might have been the year Ohio State beat Michigan by 29. I haven't gone back and looked, but uh, I think history has borne out that we may have had some sense uh, of the relative talent levels, but we get to do it again this year. Hooray. Hooray. It's our annual Ohio State Michigan tale of the tape where we take each position and measure them against each other. We'll look at the Michigan quarterbacks against the Ohio State quarterbacks, running backs against the running backs, and so on and so forth. I've got a chart here. We'll chart it. And this will allow us to maybe help figure out who has the better team this year. Because we, you know, if you don't look at it and you don't examine it, how are you even going to know what to think? So we're going to do that. We'll run through some names. We'll you know make some picks on you know, does Michigan's offensive line, are they better than Ohio State's offensive line? Ohio State's offensive line only has maybe four potential All-Americans. Does Michigan have five? I don't know. We'll talk about it, and we'll find out, and we'll see. And then by the end of this, we'll, we'll count all of the, uh, the check marks in the Ohio State box, count, down, count all of the check marks in the Michigan box that may, may not take as long as the Ohio State box, tally them up. I'll have Tom do the math. And then, boom, we'll figure out, hey, which team looks probably like they are the better program this year. And then later on in November, they'll get to either prove us right or prove us wrong, or as I would say, either prove us right or let us down. This is the, uh, this is the you know, something that we generally view as something of an academic exercise because ultimately they do play on the field and you get it settled in person. But without having a game last year, who's to say? We haven't seen them, these two teams play in uh, close to two years now. So it feels like we have to go back, revisit this, see where things stand, and then we'll find out once and for all on uh, Saturday after Thanksgiving whether we are correct or incorrect. And I, you know, I was going to say I have a feeling we'll be correct, but we don't know. Let's uh, let's figure this out. Let's go position by position. Let's start at quarterback where Michigan returns a quarterback with starting experience. Cade McNamara got, I think, one start last year in their six games. They have Alan Bowman coming in, who has started many games at Texas Tech and has thrown for a bunch of yards, but has also lost his job. Cade McNamara did not win the job last year, had to basically take over for Joe Milton, who continued who struggled. And Cade McNamara came in in relief one game, played really well, and then got a start and struggled. And then, of course, you have J.J. McCarthy, their five-star prospect that um, is the quarterback of the future. Don't necessarily know that he's the quarterback of the present. And as I've said many times, I expect all three of these guys to start at some point this season. Cade McNamara will eventually get benched and uh, something will happen to J.J. McCarthy after a couple starts and Alan Bowman will come in. And I, I, I think once Ohio State decides on their starting quarterback, whether that's C.J. Stroud, Jack Miller, or Kyle McCord, I think we're leaning towards C.J. Stroud, as we always uh, say in the show, that you know that's that's where we are. We're 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 going with CJ Stroud until we see somebody else kind of leading leading the way. I don't necessarily foresee him losing the job once he has it and once he's playing. And the reason why it's different with Michigan is because we've seen Michigan quarterbacks struggle even after winning the job. Jim Harbaugh has a track record right now. It's not a good one at Michigan. Brian Day has a track record at Ohio State. It's very good in terms of the quarterbacks. And so for me, Tom, I'm going, as strange as it may be, I'm going with the Ohio State quarterbacks because while they're unknown, the track record at Ohio State for Ryan Day is better than the track record at Michigan with, uh, I think there's more talent at Ohio State, there's just less experience. And really, I don't know how much the experience really helps the Michigan quarterbacks when your future is J.J. McCarthy. Right. And the Michigan quarterback room is super interesting to me this year because I think you've got a real moral hazard there for Jim Harbaugh where long-term for the program, J.J. McCarthy is probably the guy they should play and just treat this year as a rebuilding year and get him game experience, get him reps, get him ready for next year. I don't know that Jim Harbaugh has the luxury of 
running the quarterback room that way. I think he's got to run the quarterback room with here is who, you know, we, we have to win every possible game we can win. And, you know, you probably are starting the year with Cade McNamara either way, because he does have a little bit of starting experience. I think it was the Rutgers game. He came in and led them back uh, on the road against Rutgers last year. But, you know, he was, he was 60% completions, 425 yards, five touchdowns, no interceptions in like a game and a half, basically of action last year. And, you know, he's fine. He's just like, he's got a ceiling. He has, you know, the arm talent isn't quite what JJ McCarthy probably is. It's not what, you know, the CJ Stroud, Kyle McCord kind of guys in Ohio State's room are. He's just, he's fine, but he's got a ceiling. He's not, Cade McNamara is not a national championship winning quarterback. You could put Cade McNamara on Ohio State's team and he's probably the third or fourth quarterback in that room, most likely. And he's the guy who's likely going to start for Michigan. So, that's you know I think that that right there answers the question as far as who's who's ahead in talent, and you know it, even if you want to go five star five star JJ McCarthy versus CJ Stroud, CJ Stroud has a year of college experience. He's worked with Ryan Day in the in the offense. There you know he's just he's going to be a little bit of ahead of McCarthy. I think McCarthy is a good quarterback. I think McCarthy could be a very good quarterback in a couple of years. But how much is you know? It, I think the logical thing for Michigan to do this year would probably be start Cade McNamara and then go with the 2008 Ohio State thing where it's like, okay, you're starting Todd Beckman, but you've got this Terrell Pryor kid who you want to start getting, you know, getting reps, getting on the field, building up and getting ready for the future. But you're not going to do that until you're out of the national championship race. Well, you go out to USC, you get your heads kicked in and it's like, okay, well, now, now you're not going to win the national championships. So and now, now it's time to start looking for the future. You know, if Michigan loses to Washington, are they going to be okay with putting in Cade McNamara or JJ McCarthy at that point? And, and okay, well, we're not going to win the national championship, but we got to start building for the future. I think with Jim Harbaugh's contract situation, which is basically he, he had a, essentially an $8 million buyout after this year uh, and, and uh, got his contract after last year, got his contract extended where it's a $4 million contract with like a $4 million buyout. So he's basically got a year where they can fire him and it costs them like nothing extra beyond what it would have cost him to just employ him this year anyway. So I, I don't know that he has, you know, he's going to feel like he has the ability to think long term. He may be thinking like, just we got to get this, we got to win games now. We got it, we can't screw around. So I, I do think you're probably going to see maybe more Cade McNamara than you would have in an, you know, in an ideal situation for Michigan. But either way, yes, Ohio State is ahead of them. I'm interested to see if Jim Harbaugh starts treating his quarterbacks like a National League manager, where I can see Cade McNamara struggling in the second half against Washington. Does does he pull him at that point because we can't afford to lose this one? And then does he do the same thing to JJ McCarthy when they're struggling against, you know, Northern Illinois or Rutgers? And it just becomes this musical chairs where each quarterback is looking over their shoulder, which is completely unhealthy mm -hmm. for that entire situation, which uh, may work in the short term if you make the right moves. But eventually, guys are going to be looking over their shoulder, trying to be somebody they're not. And trying to be perfect and you can't be. And, and then they just, uh, you know, the fragility and the frailty of the, the mental makeup of a position like this, like you, those guys, you got to have them firing on all cylinders upstairs. And if they start doubting themselves or uh, thinking that they're going to be pulled for any incompletion, now they're going to be afraid to throw the ball and then boom, you just got sacked. So, yeah, yeah. That, there's just, you, you need to have a little bit of stability at the quarterback. I mean, go back to Ohio State 2015. You kind of saw that with, with mm -hmm. the shuffling of Cardale Jones and JT Barrett. Like, if you're constant looking over your shoulder, you're, you're either going to be pressing or you're going to be too hesitant and you're not going to be in the, in the right mindset to succeed. So, yeah, I think that's, that has to be a concern. And, you know, Alan Bowman is, you know, is Alan Bowman the second guy off the bench if JJ McCarthy's not ready? Is he, is, you know, if McNamara struggles, does Alan Bowman come in? Because he's, you know, he's a proven starter. He's he's played at Texas Tech. And, you know, Alan Bowman had a nice career at Texas Tech. He got hurt a lot. He had a pretty gruesome, I think, punctured lung injury a couple of years ago. He had, he had something that was, a, you know, he was off to a very promising start and then just couldn't stay healthy, couldn't stay on the field. But, you know, if, if Cade McNamara struggles early, I think you're exactly right. I think you very well could see all three quarterbacks playing meaningful snaps in September, which is not, not great for them. Well, and we'll get to running backs here in a second. It's just Cade McNamara is in a, a weird situation because he's probably the starter unless Alan Bowman beats him out. And, um, although I guess we shouldn't write off J.J. McCarthy just because he couldn't do it in the spring. Like that was, you shouldn't be able to overtake somebody in the spring. 
and maybe he does in fall camp, but it's like Cade McNamara is the guy with the, I don't know if least future is the, the proper term here, but JJ McCarthy is the future. You didn't bring in Alan Bowman to just be the third guy. Like he's kind of your emergency starter. Cade McNamara, it seems like they're just waiting for him to fail. And then you go to the next guy. And I think that's a, it's, it's an unwinnable situation when that's your guy. That's, that's your starting quarterback. You've brought in, like, you're just waiting for him to implode like Joe Milton, like Brandon Peters, like Shea Patterson. I, well, I guess it's smart then to prepare for the inevitable <laughs> as they have been. So uh, that, that's why that, it just feels like we, I, I'll speak for myself. It just feels like I know what's going to happen at quarterback for Michigan because I've, I've seen the movie so many times and this, this season is written by the same people who did the last season and the season before that. Yeah. This is, this is M night Shyamalan. Like, Oh, is there going to be some crazy twist at the end? Mm -hmm. And uh, much like uh, Jim Harbaugh's career, M night Shyamalan movies keep getting worse. Next one after, you know, one after the other. So it's pretty much, pretty much the Jim Harbaugh era summed up uh, M night Harbaugh. <laughs> just, just wait till you see the twist at the end of this one. Yeah. Uh, so let's move to running back where I, I like what Michigan has in Hassan Haskins. Uh, we assume Donovan Edwards will be good. The, the four high four star freshman running back. I know some people like Blake Corum. He's kind of a change of pace speed guy compared to Hassan Haskins, who is a former linebacker, basically Haskins. And I believe I have Michigan as my number two two group of running backs in the Big Ten East behind Ohio State. So that already tells you which way I'm going to side here. But Haskins, I like him when they give him the ball. The problem is he goes entire games where, like, I think the first half of the season he had maybe, you know, 20, 20 carries or whatever. He had a, a, a game with one carry, a couple games with, like, five carries. And then once they finally get him the ball, oh, you see that he can do pretty well. Donovan Edwards, we'll see. Blake Corum can't couldn't break a tackle last year he needs to this year but i think being a little bit thinner with the zach uh, zach charbonnet gone that helps haskins that gives michigan fewer options and they have they have now have to rely more on hassan haskins because i don't understand what jim harbaugh was doing when haskins would sit entire quarters last year uh and so i think getting him out there more is better it, it will help them more but i still don't think they have I mean, they have half the room that Ohio State does at right. running and, back. Yeah, I mean, Ohio State's got, I mean, they just, Steel Chambers just moved to linebacker as sort of, you know, so now Ohio State only has five guys in the running back room who are, you know, highly touted guys and or proven veteran guys. And, you know, I mean, Hassan Haskins is a good back, 6.1 .1 yards per carry, six touchdowns last year. Blake Corm, I know they like Blake Corm a lot. He just, he didn't do anything last year, three yards per carry. And, you know, as a speed guy, you want more than three yards per carry. Like he, he was the small guy who's supposed to have the breakaway speed. And he was just the small guy who was easy to tackle last year. That doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be what it is for the future. But right now you just, you haven't seen a whole heck of a lot out of him and Donovan Edwards. You know, I think the best case scenario with Donovan Edwards is if everything goes exactly right, he's Travion Henderson this year and Ohio state has a couple guys ahead, you know, at least with, with Tra uh, Travion Henderson who are, you know, if, if you want to say Master Teague is Hassan Haskins and Travion Henderson is Donovan Edwards, and that's probably, you know, close-ish or maybe a little generous for Michigan. Like, well, Ohio State still has Mayan Williams. Ohio State still has Marcus Crowley. Ohio State still has Evan Pryor. I mean, I, you have to, just the depth there alone, you'd have to put Ohio State ahead of Michigan there. Yeah, I don't think we really need to dwell on that one yeah. uh, because you did you did take, take a long time dwelling on the quarterbacks, Tom. <laughs> Let's go to the... Sorry to keep you waiting, everyone. <laughs> Let's go to the receivers and tight ends where I, again, I like what Michigan has. They've gotten away from just having all kinds of slot receivers. They still have got a bunch. Uh, I still think Ronnie Bell is best in the slot when he's not being defended by a cornerback, which is not a great trait for a wide receiver who has to now play on the outside. I think Cornelius Johnson kind of came in uh, into his own a little bit last year. So he, He's got a guy who's improving as a six foot three X type. Roman Wilson, true freshman last year, is super, super fast that they like in the slot. AJ Henning is another slot guy. Mike Sanger still is another slot guy. Then you add in the, the Dalen Baldwin transfer that Ohio State was trying to get in on as well. And so there's there's a lot to like here, Tom. 
Um, but is there more to like with, say, Gary Wilson, Chris Olave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? <laughs> You go through most of the positional rankings around the country and Ohio State's number one in the wide receiver room. So that's this is another one that's like, yeah, this is a pretty, pretty easy, quick decision that, you know, no one, no one in in the country probably has a better wide receiver room than Ohio State this year. So, yeah, that's that's pretty easy. I I do want to touch real briefly. Cornelius Johnson, I saw as as I was looking at this uh, earlier in the week, Cornelius Johnson was the only guy taller than six feet to catch a pass in 2020 for Michigan. Like it is just, it is a bunch of shorter guys. And, you know, Ohio State is kind of going, Ohio State is getting away from the like lots of six foot five guys kind of model of wide receiver recruiting. That's something we've talked about a little bit recently. But, you know, there's just, there's a lot of 5'10 in that Michigan recruiting and receiving room. And, you know, AJ Henning, I was, I was expecting big things from AJ Henning last year's potential like freshman breakout guy. And he had three catches for 15 yards in six games. Like it wasn't like he didn't play, he just didn't do a whole heck of a lot. Um, Ronnie Bell, I think, is very good. I think, Ohio State fans probably just you say Ronnie Bell and they go, oh, the guy who dropped the pass at, at Penn State. And that's like all anyone remembers out of Ronnie Bell. But very good player. 15 yard, 15.4 yards per carry last year. 26 for 401. Cornelius Johnson, as you said, coming along. 16, 254, 15.9 yards per catch, three touchdowns. He had a, one or two big long passes uh, last year. I remember him scoring touchdowns on Roman Wilson, a good speed guy. But it's just I mean, the depth there for Ohio State is just a million miles ahead of Michigan. Um, you know, AJ Henning at some point could turn into one of those Ohio State caliber receivers if he continues to develop. But Ohio State has, you know, like nine of those Ohio State caliber receivers. So that's that's a pretty easy one, too. Yeah, I believe uh, Henning is was a top 100 or just outside of the top 100 mm-hmm. in the recruiting rankings. You Then we talk uh, tight ends. Eric All, I know Michigan, they really like his athletic ability. He had trouble catching the ball last year with some drops. I think he, nobody is going to decide with Michigan over Ohio State and Jeremy Ruckert there and the depth that Ohio State is building there with G. Scott, Cade Stover. Uh, Michigan always has depth that tight end, but you know they, they lost some guys. And again, Eric All, athletic, but uh, had, had issues catching the ball. So just the pass catchers as a whole, Tom, am I, am I okay in marking uh, Ohio State? Uh, yes, go go ahead and market market uh, Ohio State. Yes, okay with with Penn. Okay, let's talk about the offensive line, where Ohio State is returning, you know, three or four starters. At this point, it doesn't matter because they've got uh, so much depth. But the two best tackles, arguably in the nation, Harry Miller at left guard or center, depending. Paris Johnson, the number one offensive lineman in his class, will be somewhere probably right guard. That's where he was in the spring. And then you've got a battle of the what the number one center in the 2018 class versus the number one center in the 2020 class, trying to be that fifth guy. So there's a lot to like there. Michigan has a bunch of guys with starting experience. Andrew Vastardis, the center, started. Zach Zinner was uh, had four starts as a true freshman last year. Chuck Filiaga has been around. Uh, Andrew Stuber, Ryan Hayes, Carson Barnhart all had starting experience at tackle last year. But when you've got like three different guys with starting experience at tackle, Tells me there's there's injuries or people are getting benched, and so there, there's a lot of uh, things at uh, uh, in terms of the Michigan offensive line. It's more of a like a, it's a general store where you can get kind of whatever you need. But if you, if you really want to get something uh, offensive line type, you go to the offensive line store, and that's what Ohio State does. They've gone to the offensive line store, and, and Michigan has gone to like. Um, you know, Menards looking for some offensive linemen. And Michigan's offensive line was a disaster for a decent chunk of last year. And Ryan Hayes was hurt. Jalen Mayfield was out for a stretch. Like you lose both your tackles. Like, yeah, that's turns out that's going to be bad for you if you if you lose both of your tackles. And, you know, the depth for Michigan is not what it is for Ohio State on that line. They're going to be better this year because they've got Ryan Hayes is healthy again. Chuck Filiaga is returning starter. Andrew Vistardis is healthy again. He missed some games. Zach Zinter is no longer a true freshman. Andrew Stuber, you know, started two games last year, but you know now he's he's got another year of experience. He's another guy who who should be able to, uh, you know, be, be at least decent if they can stay healthy on the offensive line. They should be solid on the offensive line. Ohio State's offensive line is again like considered one of, if not the best in the nation. So that's, you know, this is this is another relatively easy one. But I don't. I do think Ohio State fans who just look at last year's Michigan line and go, "It's going to be that bad again." Like, no, it, we won't be that bad again. They're going to be better than they were last year. But it's not. 
you know, it's not anywhere close to where Ohio State's line is right now. I agree. Let's move to the other side of the ball. Maybe things will be better there for Michigan. Uh, except, Tom, I seem to recall every time we've ever talked about the Michigan defensive line over the oh forever, the lack of depth at Michigan up front is always an issue. And and this year it's it's no different. They've got, you know, some guys like Aiden Hutchinson is good. Uh Chris Hinton is a former five star guy at tackle, hasn't really elevated himself yet. You got um Donovan Jeter who's been around for a while, kind of as the nose tackle. Taylor Upshaw's been around a while as a defensive end. A lot of these guys have been around for a while, haven't really done much. You got some young guys who haven't done anything, and, and just the depth inside is has been lacking for years, and that's why we always talk about how Michigan powers down in the fourth quarter. That's when they start to fail, and then they can't hold up in November, and, and it just all goes back to what that defensive line looks like. And it, it's even with the starting four, it's not – like there's not a lot there, and I don't even know if they know exactly who they're starting for you is going to be yet, which is is fine if you've got depth like Ohio State. It's not fine when you don't have depth and you're still not quite sure. And I'll let you go over whatever you want with Ohio State, but this one is it's as distant as it has ever been between the two schools. Like at any one position, I think a defensive line between these two schools. Yeah, and there's some question this year as to whether Michigan's going to run a 4-3 or a 3-4 and that's, you know, that they may run a 3-4 just cuz they don't have the depth and at, you know, at that spot, you know, across the line to, to run a 4-3. They've kind of mixed and matched that a little bit in the past, but you know, I mean, this is I feel like this is basically the same conversation every year, which is like, yeah, they've got Agent Hutchinson's a really good really good edge. Like he's he's going to be a good player and and he's going to go make some money in the NFL and that's that's great. Like we said the same stuff about Quiddy Pay before, we said the same stuff about uh uh, what's his name for, from Paramus who went uh, Rashawn th- Gary, Rashawn Gary. Yep. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like they've got, he's, yeah, he's good. Absolutely. And yeah, Chris Hinton was very highly rated and has been solid on the inside. Donovan Jeter has been around forever in a day and never really, like, he's one of those guys who you, you look up, it's like, wow, he's been there forever. I wonder if he's at 14 career tackles. Like, I mean, and you're not going to rack up huge numbers at the nose, but he's just, he's never, taken that step where it's just like you keep hearing his name and it never actually turns into production on the field. No more Quiddy Pay, no more Carlo Kemp on the edge. Those are two big losses. And and you get past that first line. It's like, well, Julius Welshoff, he's he was the guy who uh, they, they recruited from Germany a few years ago. And we kind of went like, that's, I mean, that's either really going to work or it's really not going to work. This is his fourth year. He has six total tackles as a career. So it just, there's, it's the same issue we had. We keep talking about every year with this, like Ohio State, you know, you're the question is, are Jack Sawyer and JT Tuomolo going to be the fifth and sixth defensive ends this year or the seventh and eighth defensive ends? Or maybe will they be able to work their way up and jump the guys who are, you know, four star, four star guys from four years ago? And maybe they'll be the third and fourth defensive ends this year. Like you just you're not having that conversation with Michigan. It's just like, well, here's the here's the four guys. And once they start like, well, there's the German guy. And uh, yeah, um, I don't know. And and. Bad news, Wisconsin's on the schedule again this year. Like that's that's gonna be a problem. That has continued to be the exact same problem every time they play Wisconsin. Like that's a problem. So yeah, I, this is another easy one for Ohio State. Yeah, and you look at Ohio State has nine defensive ends, I believe, right now. And the seven, eight, nine guy being, say, like um Darian Henry Young, Jacoby Cowan, Kermonte Hamilton would be in the two deep at Michigan at defensive end. And they one of those guys isn't even in the four deep at Ohio State, which is is insane. And so, yes, okay, I will go ahead and mark this one for Ohio State on the defensive line. Uh, so, but now we get to the linebackers. And you mentioned 3-4, three, 4-3. Four, four, three. Um, you know, we'll see what Michigan does in terms of how much they do whatever. The linebackers, Michigan has a couple of re- returning starters in Josh Ross Michael Barrett. Barrett was their Viper last year, probably is some sort of an outside linebacker this year. Josh Ross has been around, another guy who's been around forever. I know some fans weren't always happy with him, looking for him to get replaced. They lose um, Cameron McGrone, who was a really good middle linebacker last year. Uh, they have the, these hybrid, uh, you know, is he a rush edge 
you know, outside linebacker like a David Ajabo, who Ohio, who Ohio State wanted a tremendous athlete. Um, so they've got some unknowns in the young area. They've got some veterans who I don't even know if Michael Barrett will be starting this year, if, if they're going to look to replace him with some somebody bigger or somebody more consistent. Maybe they don't like that body type anymore. Compared to Ohio State with, what, maybe no career returning starters because of however many guys they had last year that have been around forever. They lose their top four. But they have three seniors. They've got, uh, you know, they've got some playing experience there. No starting experience. Michigan's numbers are better based on their two returning starters. So, um, if if you wanted to go Michigan here, I wouldn't have an issue because of the amount of unknowns. But I, having watched Josh Ross, Ross and, and Michael Barrett over the years. Like, I, I think there's room to be better than those guys, and I think Ohio State has that room. But I'm, I'm not sure that it, that it happens this year because we haven't seen it from the Buckeyes yet. Yeah, and this is a little bit like the quarterback conversation where it's like, yeah, Michigan has people back, but they're people who they're kind of looking to upgrade from. So is that a good know, thing? Yeah, like they've got, they've got proven veteran, like, okay, like they're fine. Josh Ross... My, I mean, led them in tackles last year. Michael Barrett with 44 tackles at the Viper last year. Like, they're fine. Like, they're not, they're not people who you're, you know, going to be looking at as potential All-Americans this year or anything. And then you've got a couple, like, really, I mean, David Ajabo, Taylor Upshaw. I mean, those, those are, like, totally unproven guys. And, you know, where, where are they all going to slot in? Ohio State has, you know, you have the, uh, you know, just, just the Taraja Mitchell, Dallas Gantt, Kayvon Pope, uh, Paula Ea Naoteote, if he ends up, you know, wherever he ends up sorting into that mix, um, you've got Tommy Eichenberg, you've got, you've got other guys who are in that, you know, steel chambers. I think we've talked about as, you know, probably not this year, but potentially down the line, you got Reed Carrico, who's, who's, you know, I think we have big expectations for, but again, more down the line, but, you know, if you want to be real generous, you can call this a push. Um, I went and looked at uh, Phil Steele's positional rankings just to go, you know, am I, am I like way out of line here to think that Ohio state is ahead in all of the, you know, in these certain different spots. And yeah, Phil Steele has Ohio state several spots ahead of Michigan on his positional rankings at linebacker. So there's just, there, there is a reason that the certain guy, that the guys who are first time starters at Ohio state who are fourth year guys, there's a reason they're first time starters. And it's because they had real good linebackers in previous years and dramatically better linebackers than Michigan had in previous years. So it's to me a lot like that quarterback spot where it's like, yes, Michigan has a guy back with, you know, with some experience there, but Ohio state's probably ceiling is a lot higher there. I think you're probably looking at something similar there on the, at the linebackers as well. So if you want to mark that as a push, I'm not going to fight you on it, but I think you probably would tend towards Ohio state. I just looked at the Athlon uh, position preview in the big 10. Um, they have Ohio state as the number two linebacker group of linebackers behind Wisconsin. Would you like to take a guess as to where they have Michigan's linebackers? Uh, I think Phil Steele may have had them eighth, so I'm going to say eighth. They have them ninth, which oh. is mm. that's pretty extreme. Uh, that, I was surprised by that. I, I, I guess I'm trying not to, you know, I, I don't want the negative reviews of the podcast that were biased. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. like if if you want to give Michigan one, maybe this is where, or or we we push and say, hey man. We pushed on linebacker when everybody else is saying <laughs> Ohio State. Like at the end of the year, I I expect Ohio State's linebackers to be better. And again, it's part of that track record thing where um, Michigan, you know, hasn't really been great. And how good are they going to look behind that defensive line? Which you know is is another thing to consider. Yeah, and that's that's the issue you're going to run into. The Ohio State linebackers are going to be kept clean a lot more than the Michigan linebackers are because Ohio State has so much, you know, more talented defensive line and also deeper defensive line where you can keep rotating guys in and keep them fresh and keep guy, you know, keep those linebackers clean all game. I don't think Michigan's necessarily going to have that that opportunity. You just, I mean, how many Wisconsin uh, offensive linemen are you going to see getting up to the second level to just, you know, to to drill one of those Michigan linebackers? I I feel like you're going to see that a lot and. You know, I mean, you're either measuring this on on uh, a uh, you know, you know what what they could possibly be, you know, potential, 
or you're measuring this on production. And I'm not really sure I necessarily see Michigan having monster production either way. Well, and as much as they're on defense, they're tackling a lot of guys because there's a first down and there's another first down. So mm-hmm. production, I mean, it just means your your defense is on the field too much at times. I, going based off the fact that when we did this in 2019 and had to, uh, I think we went with the quarterbacks at Michigan because Shea Patterson had experience and Justin Fields didn't. We went with Jim Harbaugh over Ryan Day because Jim Harbaugh had experience. And we knew both times, like, it's likely that it's going to be Ohio State. I. For me, since if we're saying the same, using the same logic, like we think it's going to be Ohio State, then I say we just go with Ohio State as a linebackers and, and stop making the same mistake over and over again, like that's, we have been. That's probably smart, and I think you know if you're if you're looking at uh, you know national independent sources, not viewing it as these are right next to each other, then we probably don't need to overthink it. Yeah, and if there's one thing this show will not do. <laughs> it's overthink something, so. Defensive backs, we're going to go with secondary as a whole here and um, as, as W-H-O-L-E rather than H-O-L-E. Although, it considering... Kind of, yeah, it kind, kind of works both ways for both teams in some ways, yeah. Yeah, go ahead if you want to start out. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, this is for sure the biggest question mark on the Ohio State team. But if you watched last year's Michigan team, like it's also kind of the biggest question mark on Michigan's team. So there's, there's just... Neither neither one of them is, uh, I mean, I know you haven't gone all the way through your positional rankings in the division. Mm-hmm. I think it's entirely possible Ohio State and Michigan are both, you know, three or four in the division in this spot, or, you know, maybe potentially even lower. So th- there's there's no question. No one, is, no one is saying the Ohio State defensive backfield is extremely elite this year, but Seven Banks is probably the best of the corners. Um, you know, this is, this is a spot Michigan has, Michigan has an argument for a guy who, who, you know, if you were blending these two teams, Dax Hill is starting somewhere, Mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's fantastic. His issue is he can't do it alone. He cannot cover everyone all at once. And, you know, Vincent Gray, Jamon Green, like that was real bad at the start of last year. And then it got like better as the year went along, but also like the competition wasn't super fantastic. And there's not a lot of depth there. And, you know, you look at Ohio State, it's like Seven Banks is probably the best of the corners on either of these teams. You know, you probably have, you know, if you're going to go through the depth and, and the younger guys, you'd, you'd take Ohio State's classes of their, you know, their freshmen. And, you know, even if those are not guys necessarily on the field this year, they're, you know, potential guys who could work their way into the rotation later in the year. I, I think you got to go there. I mean, Dax Hill's really good. Brad Hawkins has been around. I mean, he just is one of those guys who feels like he's been around forever and he's, you know, he's solid. He's good. He's, he's not Jordan Fuller, but he's fine. Ohio state safety is safety plays. You know, I mean, I think probably they're going to be pretty good this year. You'd expect Josh Proctor to be pretty good this year. You'd expect Lathan Ransom to be pretty good this year. You know, Marcus Williamson is back again. I mean, you've got, you've got some, you, you've got some options there. I think you go with Ohio State here. This is another one where it's not real, you know, it's not particularly, they're not, they're not running away with it like they are in the trenches, but they're also, they're not great, but they're also better than where Michigan is to me. Well, and we've seen this Michigan secondary struggle so often. And these are all four starting, returning starters, Jamon Green, Vincent Gray at corner, Brad Hawkins, Daxton Hill at safety. Brad Hawkins to me is a guy that, Michigan should have been able to replace for a couple of years now, and they've just had nobody better. And, and you're used to seeing him out there because they don't have a lot of depth. And he's he's in the picture a lot, but he's not necessarily making the plays. And it's it's almost uh, it's almost worse. You'd rather him not be in the picture at all because then then he was not responsible for giving that up. Jamon Green, Vincent Gray, they gave up big plays a lot, and when they don't, they're grabbing and holding. And for me, I, I would side with Ohio State's corners over Michigan's, Michigan's corners. The only area that I am siding with Michigan here is, is Dax Hill. And if that's just one of the, let's say, five starters, let's, you know, Michigan's, Michigan's issue has always also been a nickelback because that's an area Ohio State has always abused, and not just Ohio State. Other programs have, have as well. And you know, who is that? Is it DJ Turner who has not? played very much or played very well. Ohio State's depth here wins out. I believe their corners will be better. Brad Hawkins, to me, I, I think Ohio State has 
they could put anybody out there and they would be Brad Hawkins, basically, and, and get that level of production and security. And then obviously they're hoping for more than that. Daxon Hill is a special player to me. I, I think he's 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 outstanding. He is probably the only guy off the top of my head that would start at Ohio State right now from Michigan. And I, I I'm just scanning through here. I don't know that anybody else would. And we could talk about that after we get done with all of this. But yeah, I'm gonna go Ohio State here as well because Michigan secondary hasn't been a strength in a in a very, very long time. And even if Ohio State's secondary is an issue this year, it's going to be better than it was last year. And I think Ohio State's secondary was better than Michigan's last year. Yeah, I mean, you go through it and I mean you think back to the Ohio State secondary last year and it's like, oh man, they really got lit up by Alabama. Like, well, Michigan got lit up by Michigan State. So, and, and I mean, like Ricky white put on like an absolute just highlight real clinic and then do, didn't do anything else the entire rest of the year. I think he had 250 yards against Michigan. And I don't know what he finished up with. I can look that up in a minute, but it was just like a huge percentage of his production was against Michigan in that one game. That's indicative of like, yeah, there's, there's probably some structural issues on the back end there. And, you know, with as much turnover as they've had on their staff, I mean, you've got a new defensive coordinator this year. It just, it just seems like you're asking guys who are not super fantastic to learn a new system and like, it's going to be different. Is it going to be better? Like eh, you would like a little more continuity. That just, that just seemed to me like, well, this is a kind of a desperation move. We're going to overhaul everything. We're going to bring in good recruiters. We're just going to see, you know, the guy who's coaching quarterbacks hasn't coached quarterbacks since 2017. doesn't matter. We're going to bring him in. He's going to fix the recruiting. It's like, well, I mean, you look at the recruiting, it's like, yeah, I mean, they're bringing in players, but they're bringing in, a, you know, you're, a lot of the names that you're, they're bringing in right now are names that Ohio State fans probably have to look up because they're not recruiting the same kids. Like they're, Ohio State's recruiting at one level, Michigan's recruiting, a, you know, recruiting at a different level. And there's a lot of, well, yes, but this guy's really underrated. It's like, well, I don't, I don't think the scouting services have missed on all of them. Like maybe you can, you can try and make, make, your, make your hay with the, guys who are kind of under the radar guys, but sometimes they're from Germany and are, they're in their fourth year and they've got six tackles. Like sometimes that's a thing that happens too. They're not, they're not all criminally underrated. Ricky white, eight catches for 196 yards in week two last year against Michigan finished the season with 10 catches for 223 yards. So, um, so I may have been a little, uh, I may have slightly undershot the uh, what 50% or so of his season production. Yeah. I mean, that's just, and, and like, you'll have guys who will blow up on one day. Like, I mean, I think you think back to like Ron Johnson from Minnesota in 2000, like he had that big blow up day against Ohio state, but it wasn't like, yeah, he had two catches the rest of the year. Like, mm, that's, that's a, uh, that's, that's a red flag there. If, if you have that kind of thing. Yeah. The Wisconsin receiver against Bradley Roby in what, 2013, when he put up all of those yards because Ohio state focused all of their attention on stopping the run. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we have decided on uh, the Ohio State secondary there. Now, I think this might be Michigan's first win. We're mm -hmm. going to go to this, the special teams where Ohio State is, is they have a semi-returning kicker in that Jake Seibert, as a true freshman last year, kicked a couple of field goals, attempted a couple of field goals, and I think it was like 16 for 16 on extra points. They do also I have, I think, Dominic DiMaggio, their kickoff specialist, is back. They bring in uh, Noah Ruggles, the transfer from UNC. They have an Australian punter. He's a true freshman, Jesse Mirko. Uh, he's a freshman, but he's Australian. So, you know, but Michigan returns all of their kicking specialists and they're experienced and they're not bad. I mean, while I know we keep saying the, 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 the known average versus Michigan, we can't keep siding. We can't side with that over the, the unknown superior talent of Ohio State. Here, I am going to go ahead and side with the Michigan kicking game over the Ohio State kicking game because they are more proven. They have more experience. And yes, each of them have failed in their own ways, but they've also succeeded more. And maybe I'm a little spooked by what we saw in the spring from Ohio State and the fact that they had to bring in another kicker and the punting didn't look all of that great. Yeah, I mean, the track record at Ohio State is not fantastic. Jake Seibert missed a couple field goals in the spring game. I mean, Jake Moody for Michigan was one of four on field goals last year. He made one from 40, was 0 for 2 inside 40, one for 2 from 40 to 49. I mean, that's just, 
Like it's fine. It's, I, I don't, I think that's, if you want to call that a push, that's a push. Brad Robbins, Brad Robbins was really good last year, netted out more than 40 yards a kick for, for Michigan as a punter. I, I think I would go with Michigan there. Just, I mean, that's a, just, you've got the, the uncertainty of Jesse Murko. He's probably going to be fine. But again, like we're going off of a spring game look here. There's not, we don't have a whole heck of a lot else to go on. We watched a little bit. Of, they, they always run punt when we're watching practice. So we got to watch a little bit during practice and, you know, you had, you had some shanks. It wasn't like constant shanks, but it was like, it was not, you know, we, we're used to watching Drew Christman at practice and it's just like down the field, perfect, down the field, perfect, down the field, perfect. And it was definitely not that. So you've got some consistency concerns for Ohio state. I, I think the kickers are more or less a wash to me. Like, I mean, Moody, Moody and Cybert are probably fairly similar in my mind where they've performed a little bit. They looked shaky, but it was a first time college kicker. So you can kind of excuse that. But the punter, you've just got a little bit more of a proven uh, proven thing for for Michigan there with Brad Robbins. So I'll I'll uh, take Michigan there on the special teams. I also think Michigan's going to have to be more aggressive in return in the return game to help their offense, whereas Ohio State's return game is almost non-existent. So I think by default you side with Michigan there as well. So I am going to give Michigan a shiny check mark in their bracket. So that well we'll we'll, we'll tally these up after we get done talking about the coaches. The, and just the head coaches in particular. This is a Ryan Day versus Jim Harbaugh thing. Um, I, I what I would say is, say what you want, but Ryan Day did not beat Jim Harbaugh last year like he said he was going to do. Mm, that's true. That's true. Yeah, and and you know if you go by age, Jim Harbaugh is older, uh, more likely to get a discount at Bob Evans, uh, more likely to eat dinner a little earlier. Uh, more likely to have a lot of free time a year from now. I mean, there's there's a bunch of ways that Harbaugh is probably ahead of of Ryan Day right now. I think you also probably are, you know, you go back to that 2019 show where we're kind of went, well, you don't quite know what you have with Ryan Day yet, and you kind of know what you have with Jim Harbaugh. I feel like at this point, we kind of know what we have with Ryan Day. I don't know what you're getting out of Jim Harbaugh this year. I mean, this is like, they did the, you know, he did the coaching stat, you know, the assistant coach overhaul thing. He's, you know, flipped both of his coordinators now in the last couple of years. Like, this is it. Like, this is very clearly like the last stand of, you know, the last stand of the Mohicans this year. If he doesn't do it this year, like it ain't happening. You look at his contract status. He really, really, really needs to go nine and three or somehow beat Ohio State or, you know, play, you know, go, go 10 and two, go nine and three and play very competitively with Ohio State. That might be enough to keep him around. But there's just, he'd have to be recruiting pretty well. And the recruiting is like, it's fine. It's not great it's fine there's a lot of there's a lot of guys they're taking right now they're like yeah i mean either you're really early on this or you're taking plan b guys real early in the cycle it's one of those two things and you know we'll 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 all find out together in the next couple years but if these are not all extremely underrated guys who you know that they're just smarter than everyone else then we're having this same conversation about this exact show for several more years now this is not, I think this is not a hole that Michigan's going to dig out of real quickly. This is a, this is something that's a long-term process. And I don't, you know, I don't think that that's something that necessarily Michigan fans would necessarily disagree with because you see a lot of Michigan basketball talk on Michigan, uh, Michigan websites, even, even in the summertime when it's getting close to Michigan football season, there's an awful lot of Michigan basketball talk right now. I think that that's just reflective of, an overall understanding of where these two programs are right now compared to each other. I mean, Ohio state beat them by beat Michigan by 29 in Ann Arbor in 2019, beat them by 23 in Columbus in 2018. The spread last year for the game that didn't happen, the point spread was 30, 30 points. Just to put that in perspective, like other games in that neighborhood recently for Ohio state, 2020 Nebraska was a 27 point spread for the opening game of the season in, in Columbus, 27 point spread. I mean, Nebraska is coming off of like a five and seven kind of season last year, 2019 at Northwestern, 27 point spread. Like that's the the kind of gap you're talking about. That, that was not the good Northwestern team. That was the bad Northwestern team between the two good Northwestern teams. Florida Atlantic, 2019, 27 point spread. 2018 versus Rutgers, 35 point spread. 2017 versus Army and Maryland, which again, this is not a good Maryland team. This was a bad Maryland team. 2017, 30 point spread. That's that the talent gap between Ohio State and Michigan last year 
And let's let's be clear, there was some there were some injuries. This was not a Michigan team playing at full strength by any means, but the talent gap between the two teams that would have faced off last year in Columbus was perceived as the same as the talent gap between Ohio State and Army or Ohio State and Maryland in 2017, down to the point. That's exactly where it is. That that to me, I looked it up and I went, oh, oh my, that's I mean, 30, 30 points is a lot. 30 points is a lot to give in a football game, especially a rivalry game. But you know, you go back to go back to the mid '90s when you had Ohio State blowing some of those games. Like even you know the '96 game, I think they were a 17 point favorite, which at the time seemed like impossible to believe these two teams could be 17 points apart. Like how could that possibly be? And now you've got almost double that last year. So I, I think that's pretty reflective of where where things are right now. And uh, to answer your question that you asked 17 minutes ago, yes, Ryan Day over Jim Harbaugh. Okay, that's what I that I was going to make sure to, to get you to clarify that as well. I'm probably on the same page with you, especially when you consider the recruiting that has, is going on where Ryan Day has taken Urban Meyer's recruiting and upgraded it because apparently it wasn't good enough and not only upgraded it, but also modernized it and, and put his own twist on it and you, you're seeing the results and you'll continue to see the results. And while Michigan is more of a, you know, we develop players, but they're not. And so when you when you're struggling to recruit, and I say struggle, they have the number 10 recruiting class right now in, in a 2022 cycle. But we also know that the SEC rises late and uh, talent goes and Michigan will have some decommitments. That's what happens to all schools. And and Michigan's problem has been the the bottom heavy or the top heavy class with a lot of bottom dragging it down that doesn't get developed. And then and sometimes those guys have to play and it's like, well, they were never intended to play. And if they were, you thought you would be able to develop them. And that's something they have not done. Well, that was something I, I've said before. I thought Jim Harbaugh would excel at that. He has not excelled at that. And you're seeing the results of that. And you can't rely on the the number 800 player and four of those guys in the class. And it's now you, you do that over three or four years. Now you've got, you've got 12 of those guys. and eventually you're going to have to rely on them. And that's why you're starting a former walk on at center and this guy here and that guy there while Ohio state is figuring out which five-star guy are we going to put on the interior of the offensive line to go with the five stars at quarterback and running back and receiver and tight end. And if you look at the average player ranking, I mean like that they're 10th overall in the, in the country and third, the big 10 right now in total recruiting points. It's like, that's great. That that's good. If you look at the average ranking of player uh, on 247's composite rankings right now, uh, Ohio, the gap between Ohio State and Michigan is greater than the gap between Michigan and the lowest ranked team in the Big Ten uh, in the Illinois. So, you know, and, and again, like you've got, you know, th- th- you're going to have some different positions that are like, but it's like overall, these are classes that are more than halfway full. And the gap between Ohio State and Michigan in terms of average player ranking is greater than the gap between Ohio, Ohio than Michigan and the absolute bottom of the Big Ten. I, I, I am kind of tempted to look at like Mac schools. Like, who's the best Mac team <laughs> in recruiting? I, I, I feel like they're not. Yeah, there's, they, there's, uh, it's actually, it's actually uh, like Ohio State and like a mid-level Mac school, or between Michigan and a mid-level Mac school is the difference between Ohio State and Michigan right now. Which is just, I mean, it's impossible to fathom, but. Yeah, I mean Ohio State and or Michigan and Michigan and Western, Michigan and Western Michigan are actually pretty similar uh, in terms of the gap between Ohio State and Michigan and Michigan and like Western Michigan. And we see the results on the field, and we would have seen them last year as well. So I will go ahead and put that one in the uh, the Ohio State box. That gives us uh, eight check marks for Ohio State, one check mark for Michigan. That check mark for Michigan though is special teams, and we know special teams wins games. Mm-hmm, that's true. I don't know if it wins the game. Well, what, what is it? What is the spot that we just said? Very clearly, Michigan has an advantage. Why did we give them the special teams thing? The punt, punting. What is the most important play in football? The punt. There you go. What will Michigan do a lot this year? Is Ohio State doomed? My column. So that will that will wrap that up. Eight to one for Ohio State. Uh, quickly. Who from Michigan starts at Ohio State? For me, it's it's just Dax Hill, and I know some people would say Aiden Hutchinson. I don't know that that's a definite thing. I think Daxton Hill could definitely start somewhere, but um, 
you know, I, I would assume that he would be starting over Josh Proctor or Lathan Ransom because he would have last year as well. So he would be an incumbent type of guy. Yeah, he starts somewhere back there. I mean, you put him in the put him in the slot, put him at that second safety spot ahead of. You know, I mean, like he he's he's starting ahead of Marcus Williamson somewhere. He's mm-hmm. you know, or, or Lathan Ransom or Josh Proctor somewhere. Yeah, Dax Hill to me, Brad Robbins to me, I think is is starting yeah, at Ohio right. State. Aiden Hutchinson is, you know, in this in this world, has Aiden Hutchinson been coached by Larry Johnson for the last couple of years? Because mm-hmm. in that case, like I'm I'm willing to entertain that. He's Aiden Hutchinson in the rotation at Ohio State. Yeah. Uh, you know, Chris Hinton's maybe in the defensive tackle rotation at Ohio State. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe is, Ron, is Ronnie Bell in the slot? I, I still don't. I know. I think they're going to go Jackson Smith and Jigba there. I don't think so. I mean, you know, Donovan Edwards is probably in that Ohio State running back rotation. You know, in he's he's somewhere in that that Ohio State depth. I mean, you want to put him third or fourth? But if know. Ohio State wanted him, they could have had him. Yeah. Well, Not yeah, that they and, didn't want him. But right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a yes. pecking order. Right. Right. I mean, you're not you're not starting a quarter, but you're not deferring to you know defaulting to well, Cade McNamara has played before, so he's like no, that's not. And JJ McCarthy is kind of the same thing. Like, well, if Ohio State wanted JJ McCarthy, they could have taken him instead of Kyle McCord, and they made their choice. So, yeah, I I think you're really looking at like Aiden Hutchinson's in the rotation somewhere, Dax Hill's starting somewhere, Brad Robbins is starting somewhere. You know, at Ponder. Other than that, like I really, I really don't see anyone that I think there's a real good argument to be made that they're they're starting over someone at Ohio State. Yeah, that's where I am as well. So that will do it. That's our tale of the tape. Again, let me tally this up: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight check marks for Ohio State. Let me tally this up for Michigan. One, one for Michigan. So, uh, which which one of those is higher? I went to I went to a public university. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't know which one's higher. Is that is that good? So then what we do to figure out what the score is going to be the, for the game, we multiply those numbers by 10. Mm, okay. So if we take the 8 times 10, 80 to 1 times 10, Tom, 11. 80 to 11. Ohio State, yet again, two years in a row, fails to hang 100 on Michigan. <laughs> so um, that will do that show. Always a fun one, the, the Michigan tale of the tape. We enjoy it. Um, don't know if we enjoy it as much as the Michigan fans listening, but I think we did give you an honest assessment of both programs i mean that's uh, seriously that's what we do we respect the rivalry we're not going to just trash michigan well and this is here's the thing i mean you you want to go through any you know 24 7 uh roster talent rankings guess what it's going to tell you the same thing like this is not you know again like go through phil Steele, go through athlon go through lindy's whoever whoever does these things like they're going to be largely telling you the same stuff we're telling you here and if you you know, if you if you think these guys, these guys are being negative about all this, you know, like go back, find the show from 2018 where we're telling you, like, I mean, they're fine, but the interior of the defensive line is kind of a problem. Go back and find the 2019 team. Like, we're gonna be telling you the same stuff. Like all the stuff, you know how Michigan has had a bunch of disappointing seasons in a row, and it's been like, why why does Wisconsin keep killing them? Well, because of the stuff we're talking about on these shows. Like there are certain areas where they're that are very important areas for a football team. That Michigan has not excelled in recently. And, you know, I mean, if they, if they suddenly bring in a couple five-star defensive tackles, like, yeah, that's going to change things a lot, but it hasn't happened yet. So, you know, I, I think I would just ask to be evaluated by the uh, previous, previous uh, results and, uh, con- you know, evaluate our conversations a year from now or six months from now and tell us, tell us whether we're right then, because I suspect we will be right. I think what I'll do when I write this post up is I'll include the past ones that we've done. I don't even know how far we've gone back, but I will include all of those for uh, people to go in and, and listen and judge and then rate and review five stars only, of course, the show. Uh, so that will do it. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for watching. Reminder to check out BuckeyeScoop.com. Listen to all of our podcasts, of which there are many. And uh, the content on the Ask the Insiders board is always buzzing i'm sure there's something going on right now if you're not yet a member go ahead and become a member that's an even even an invite for the michigan fans listening uh we will talk about michigan if you want to start a thread about it we will talk about michigan i'm sure there'll be plenty of friendly people in that thread wanting to talk about michigan with you so thank you all for listening thank you for watching and we will talk to you guys later